Okay, guys, let's go even deeper into space with Chris Hadfield. He's a retired astronaut and an author. He made history when he became the first Canadian to perform a spacewalk. Colonel Hadfield, thanks so much for making time for us on this historic day. Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, it's uh, an amazing human accomplishment and, and a really positive step forwards. And I'm just so delighted to see that uh, everything was successful. The four crew members are all okay. Let me ask you, before we dig into the more technical aspect of this mission and the project, that moment when I guess the hatch releases and you are peeking out and seeing everything, <laughs> you're seeing the universe for the first time and there's nothing between, I mean, if you're a spiritual person, there's you, God and whatever faith you believe in just out there. What is that moment like? It, it's an amazing transition, Natasha, because you're inside the airlock and the hatch doesn't just magically open. You're the person that physically, like like taking off a manhole cover and you, and you undo this thing and you pry it out of the way and then you pop open the thermal cover, you grab the sides and I don't know, to me it felt like I was maybe giving birth to myself. You know, you, you pull yourself out, but the transition is almost magical from this little tiny confined space you are now out in the eternal three-dimensionality of the universe itself and the earth is separate from you the earth is now this huge kaleidoscope of color but it's distant and separate and somehow the choices of your life have taken and the opportunities that canada has given you have gotten you to a point where now you are are this this emissary of everyone taking those very first steps out into the universe and it's so unbelievably humbling and beautiful and and as you say almost mystical i, I you know we celebrate it on the back of our five dollar bill that that uh, ability for canadians to spacewalk and i count myself hugely lucky to be one of them is it scary because some of the visuals we're showing are isaacman just out there and it's pure blackness. We don't get to see the multicoloredness of the earth. It's just dark. Yeah, I don't think things are scary, Natasha. Just sometimes people are scared. Mm. And and if normally when you're scared, it's because you're not ready. But th this crew of four has been training for years. Uh, Jared Isaacman, I know him. Uh, I have spent a long time talking with him about what happened today, the seriousness of what he's doing, risking not only his own life, but three other lives, making sure that everything was done well. Um, and And so it's just such an amazing human experience for them. They were so ready. They were stuck in quarantine waiting for good weather. So I, I think if you ask them, were they scared? No. Were they excited? Absolutely. And were they ready for this thing? I, I would much rather be ready than scared. And that's what astronauts do. They get ready for things so that you can have those amazing human experiences, sort of to some degree, on behalf of everyone else. So let's talk about that, the, the getting ready, the preparation and the training, and the idea of they're not government-sponsored astronauts. These are private individuals. We are describing them as civilian travelers to outer space. Uh, what do you know of how they were trained? And is it comparable to the type of training you received? Yeah, we're still making up the new words. I mean, lots, most of the astronauts are civilians. Uh, so, you know, however, they, they aren't government employees. Um, I think it's a wonderful advance that the technology has gotten so good. So many professional astronauts have taken the risks over the years that now we've got the technology good and repeatable enough that the cost has come down so low that one individual can afford to pay for a flight like this. It, it's a person who made a lot of money, but still it's one individual. And uh, I think that's happened in vehicle travel, in airplanes, and now it's starting to happen in space flight. And they trained in some of the same facilities that I did, inside a vacuum chamber at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, a lot of preparation in, in simulators, uh, talking to astronauts like myself. So they got as ready as they could possibly be. And this suit, it's only the, like, uh, version one, there's going to be continuous improvement. They need to build a backpack on it so it doesn't need to be connect connected by an umbilical. You know, there's a lot of forward progress to go. But today was a really important, you know, one small step. You mentioned the suits there. They are critical to what was accomplished today. They took two years to develop. Describe what the suits are like, again, compared to what you had to wear. Uh, 
We've tried to take advantage of all of the technology of the last 40 years since the last new spacesuit. Uh, changes in manufacturing techniques, integrating things right from the beginning, not just sort of bolting them on, uh, trying to make a suit that is as easy to get on and off as possible, that, that has simple interfaces, that has like a, a nice laser heads up display for monitoring inside as a good reliable uh, air purification and air carbon dioxide removal system. How does it cool itself? All those things really take advantage of what we've learned from the, the spacewalks in the past so that this becomes truly the desirable suit of the future. And when the first people uh, are starting to settle on the moon over the la next decade, it'll be like a, a, a daughter or a granddaughter of this suit that, that they will be wearing and just sort of taking for granted the decades and decades of risk and technological advancement that brought us to today. Colonel Hatfield, what if it had gone wrong? What if the suit didn't work? What, what is the, thank goodness it didn't and everything was fine, but what happens if, I don't know, you tell me, like what if one of them gets sucked into space? When I was talking with the commander, Jared Isaacman, a while ago, getting ready for this, that's what we talked about. If everything goes right, then, then you know life isn't too hard. But life, especially an astronaut's life, is about getting ready for things to go wrong. And a couple of the biggest problems would be, what if the suit had a leak or a mm -hmm. malfunction? What if the ship started to fail because all the air is out of it and now everything's at thermal vacuum? Or what if the hatch wouldn't close so now they could never repressurize their ship. But they thought of all those things. They practiced all those things. They ran hundreds of simulations so that if those things happen, they don't want them to happen. It's like when I was blinded during my first spacewalk. It's not what you want, but if you practice enough and get ready, then it's just a thing that happens and now you just have to use all of your uh, learned experience to deal with it. But fortunately, for these four newbies up there. And uh, Jared Isaacman's flown in space once before, but none of them have done a spacewalk. For those four folks, the systems all work great. They, they, I think the hatch automatic system didn't work as planned, but they had a good manual system for it. They've learned a huge amount. And I'm really looking forward to talking to them when they get back here in a few days and uh, see how we're gonna continue to evolve and improve the, the Mark II and the Mark III and the Mark IV versions of that suit. What do you think today is going to mean for the history books and for the future of space travel? When we invent a new way to travel, like think how significant the invention of a boat that could sail across oceans or of a train that could travel at high speed or an airplane that could carry passengers, those revolutionized uh, human understanding of the world and human capability. And spaceships are like that, but space suits are also like that. Because a space suit is really just a little one person spaceship. And, and so to have a new technology and now initially proven capability, it's like one of those major historical thresholds. And, uh, and I'm, I'm great to see this suit added to the stable of suits that exist. And, and I'm we're just going to soon take it for granted that people can throw on one of these space suit, SpaceX suits and, and walk on the surface of the moon. It, that's, that's coming in the next 10 or 15 years. And, and uh, I think it's amazing to be alive now when our technology and our drive and our capability come together to make this part of the human experience. Chris Hatfield is an astronaut. He's also the author of his latest book, The Defector. He's our guest. Thank you so much, Colonel Hatfield, for making time for us today and putting this all into spatial perspective. Thanks, Natasha. Be well. You too.